Hello, and thanks so much for checking out the Coin Stories podcast video page. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm talking to the leading voices in Bitcoin about their origin stories, career paths, and why they believe in BTC. This podcast is not financial advice. If you want to see more interviews, please hit the subscribe button and like the video below. I'm excited to share my guest this week is the intrepid Will Clemente. Will quickly amassed a big following in the Bitcoin space as a sharp on-chain analyst and writer. His deep dives and insights into Bitcoin's metrics have caught the attention of greats like Willy Wu and Pomp, and now Will has his own newsletter you can subscribe to. It's hard to believe Will is actually still in college, so I'm sure he'll go on to do big, big things in the Bitcoin world. Here's Will. All right, Will, it's so nice to have you join me. Thank you so much. And I know you're you're getting ready to go back to school, huh? You're in college. Yeah, I'm getting ready to head back for my uh, my junior year. I'm really excited because I missed out on most of last year. I was I was there for like two weeks before we uh, got sent home from COVID. So I just think it's incredible how young you are and how big you are already in this space and how smart you are when it comes to all these um, on-chain metrics. So, but let's take it back a little bit. Like, where are you from? And tell me a little bit about your upbringing. Yeah, sure. So um, I grew up a little south of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm in a very small town called Fuquay Verena. Um, it, it's pretty much just like farmlands and stuff out by me. I, I live out by like a rock quarry out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, so so I've grown up Southern, but my family's from New York. So you see that and, and that's a, the Brooklyn Nets jersey behind me. Um, my, my family's from New York. So a lot of a lot of influence from them. Um, like, you know, some of my family, like my grandpa has like a really thick New York accent. So um, it, it kind of kind of weird because like I have always grown up here in North Carolina. But then again, like a lot of the um, you know, just a lot of my, my family and just things we do, it's, it's kind of uh, derived from the north. So I'm a little bit of a mix in that sense. That's so cool. What about, do you have siblings? What what kind of jobs did your, your parents do when you were growing up? Yeah, sure. So uh, my dad works for Lenovo, the computer company, and um, my mom, she stayed at home. So they actually met at IBM. She was uh, his manager, but then um, she ended up, you know, staying at home and then um, the section of, of uh, IBM he worked in got bought out by Lenovo. So, uh, so yeah, so my mom just, she stays at home, you know, obviously I've been a lot closer with my mom naturally. So she's been a, a big influence on me um, in that sense. Uh, I have two sisters. So one's older, she goes to uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, I go to ECU, which is like an hour and a half east kind of towards the coast. And then, you know, she's in Chapel Hill, which is pretty close to Raleigh, about 45 minutes. So my younger sister, she's um, a sophomore in, in high school and she does like a bunch of theater and, and acting stuff. So we're all we're all a little different because like, you know, I'm, I'm into all this data stuff. My older sister, she does um, like writing. I think she wants to be like some kind of writing professor or something like that. Um, I think she's figuring it out still. And then my younger sister, she's into like all this art stuff. So it's, it's weird because like I'm very introverted and then she's she's very outgoing. So she, you know, she, she sings in front of people and dances and all this stuff. I'm like, I would never do any of that. So it's, it's funny how we both all came out different. Yeah, no, that's so interesting about siblings. So what got you interested in data and finance? When did that all start for you? Yeah, um, it, it was after my freshman year of high, I mean, of uh, college. I, I switched my major like four times. So I came in as entrepreneurship. Then I went to management, um, and then I came after my after my um, my my first semester. I came back home. I needed a job because I I had like no money. I blew all my money in my first semester, um, partially because like this is a little side note. I graduated high school a year early, so I, I hadn't really like thought to save up money for college because it was just kind of out of the blue decision that I decided to do that because I just took like an extra class or two. I, I'm not like crazy smart in that sense or anything. I, I just took an extra class so I could get out early. Um, but I didn't realize I could do that. So I hadn't really saved up a lot of money throughout high school, but, you know, head for college. Um, so anyway, so I came back from my first semester and I needed a job on the fly. And the only place that uh, that took my application was Michael's, the arts and crafts store. Um, and the only position they had was like this overnight stocking job, which was, you know, I was like, this is going to suck. But, you know, it is what it is. I didn't I need money for a second semester. So I'd come in at like one or two a.m., um, you know, work throughout the whole night and then sleep throughout the day, my whole winter break. But, you know, the, the thing was that, that, and this is where this ties back into finance. I know I'm going a little off the side here, but um, I would be so bored throughout the shift. Like, you know, I'd just be listening to the same music 
um and i was just like you know I, I like rap music so after a while it's like i'm just like filtering the same like nonsense into my head and i'm like i need to i, I need to like make use out of this time because it's so boring there's nobody there it's just dead silent um and this is like you know my whole day because i'm sleeping during the, the actual day so i decided i was going to listen to a podcast and so I, I checked out uh preston fish who i think like everybody in the bitcoin community is familiar with uh, I checked out his podcast and I've listened to um, every single podcast that Preston's ever put out. Um, I, I started, I started, you know, on episode one and then I've just listened throughout the whole, the whole shift. And so that's, that's kind of how I got this um, interest in finance and just kind of like business in general was, was mostly through Preston. Um, and so like Preston's podcast is mainly based on value investing, which is, you know, essentially taking the free cash flows that a business generates and then projecting it out into the future to, you know, find a fair valuation of the stock now. Um, but when you're doing that, you know, when you're doing any kind of like discount cash flow um, modeling, you're, you're taking into account that this underlying um, assumption that uh, money, money uh, it, it is sound, right? That, that the, the measurement that you're using is fixed, which it's not because um, the value of, of the dollar is going down. Um, and so when you realize that, then, then, you know, seeing uh, growth and momentum stocks outperforming value, um, it, you know, the reason, the reasoning behind that makes a lot more sense. Um, and then that also leads you to, you know, what is the solution to this problem? You know, what, what is the hardest, you know, sound for money out there? And, and you know, eventually that, that leads you to Bitcoin. So when exactly did you start kind of analyzing the blockchain? I mean, when did you even hear about Bitcoin? Yeah, um, I, th I think it was like initially on Preston's podcast. And then I just kind of went on my own kind of like little rabbit hole. Um, it was in August. I think I bought my first um, Satoshi. So I think it was like the first two, three weeks of August, I really went hard at it. And then of course I came across, you know, every, every person who probably comes in the space comes across like plan B stock, the flow model um, and just, you know, like Peter McCormick's podcast, Pomp's podcast, all these kinds of things. And so um, just like a couple of the big thought leaders in the space and just kind of like, listening to, to a lot of, you know, the, the podcasts that they've done that got a lot of views and stuff like that. So just like very surface level things. Um, but in terms of like actually looking at, um, you know, the on-chain stuff that really wasn't until um, like late December, early January, uh, Willie Wu does a, uh, a, it's a, I think they do monthly podcast with Peter McCormick on the what Bitcoin did podcast. Um, and so it was after, like, right after we broke out from all time highs, I was listening to this conversation with them and, just listening to the way that Willie was kind of like describing what was going on in the market was fascinating. So from there, I just, you know, it's a very niche thing. So there's not a whole lot of content out there, but I just kind of looked into everything I could find. I, I went on YouTube and was just, you know, endlessly, you know, like binge watching all these different videos of Willie and um, this guy, David Quell, who's like another one of the kind of like more OG people in the space. Um, and just like listening to all the podcasts and videos and stuff that they've done, um, and just like trying to pick their brains about how they kind of mentally approach the stuff. Um, I, th I think that was, that was really how I kind of got like this foundational um, understanding about it. Cause like, once again, there, there really isn't any, um, you know, formal education for the stuff. Cause it's so, it's still so niche, right? Like it's e even a lot of people in the Bitcoin community don't pay a lot of attention to it, I think. And um, you know, partially that's to my advantage cause it's still like informa information asymmetry where like people don't take it serious. So you know, the, I, I see what I see. And so I'm able to use it to my advantage. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's still so early on, um, like even in the last three to five months, like I have stuff now that we didn't have back then. And then, you know, you look like two years ago and the stuff that they were using looks like ancient. And so, you know, I, I think just in the next five, 10 years alone, when you start to get people that are like, um, you know, like MIT math level, uh, you know, uh, knowledge in here, then I, I think you're going to just see like a explosion in, in terms of like, um, the, you know, the signals and stuff that you can derive from this. Yeah, that's so true. And wait, I, I'm just fascinated. So you mean August of 2020 and then December, January of like essentially this, this past year? Yeah, exactly. I, I've, I've had a lot of extra time on my hands because I've been stuck in the house. So I think uh, that, that played a big part of it. But yeah, just, I've just been, uh, pretty much just binge watching podcasts and YouTube. <laughs> I just think that's so, so incredible and that's such like a great message because I think a lot of people see Bitcoin as super nuanced and almost intimidating, right? There's so much information out there and you have to kind of go down the rabbit hole. 
But at the same time, it's completely possible. Like you gained all this knowledge just in the last year. You're while you're in college, right? While you're sitting at home during a pandemic and you're young, like anyone can do this. Like I think that you're kind of a prime example that anyone could get into it at any time and still quickly become sort of a leader in this space. That must be exciting to you. Yeah, it, it, it's been pretty wild. Like, you know, sometimes I'm still kind of in disbelief of it. And, you know, like I try not to let it, you know, like affect how I, you know, think about anything or like approach stuff. But yeah, I mean, it, it is just kind of a testament to, you know, the, the Bitcoin community doesn't care if, you know, your kid's still living with his parents or, you know, you're like a anonymous anime character on, on Twitter. Like if you're providing some kind of value, um, you know, the, the Bitcoin community is going to recognize that. And like you said, it's, it's still so early on that there's still so much to learn. And like, um, you know, for example, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people are like, oh, you must be so good with numbers and stuff. And like, I barely got past my last math class, but you know, a lot of, it's just like basic like ratios and, and stuff like that. So like, if you put the time in, you know, and you could, you could do it. It's, 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 I think like more, um, it, it looks more intimidating than, than it really is, I guess. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Wait, so you were working at Michael's, you start listening to Preston's podcast. And at this point, are you, did you like shift your major to finance and, but like on your free time, you were just diving down the ra the rabbit hole of Bitcoin. Yeah. So last year, um, well, I should say when I came back from Michael's, I actually switched my major back again to, um, finance. And then I also did computer science. And then I did like my first, like not at school, but like online course on computer science. And I ditched that and realized that wasn't for me. <laughs> so then just was left with the finance. But uh, yeah, since then I've, I've, I've stuck with the, with the finance major. And then on the side, I'm just, you know, doing this stuff whenever I wasn't in school. Cause you know, online, online school, you could kind of just do it at, at your own pace, which I like. Um, I mean, it's, it's not as like personalized where obviously like they're just sending stuff out and you don't even talk to your teacher or anything, but at the same time, you can decide to do your work whenever, right? Like I just have an assignment and it's due Friday at this time. And so I don't have to go to any lecture, you know, whatever time or, you know, get out of bed or anything. Uh, so it's, it's nice in that sense that I was able to kind of like um, prioritize between the two and like build my own schedule, which I think like help, helped out a lot because, um, you know, just, just not having to, just not having to actually go into class and being able to figure it out myself. I, I, I personally work a lot better that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, so before we talk a little bit about your on-chain analysis and your Bitcoin analysis, um, tell me just a little bit about, did you grow up thinking about money or did the discovery of Bitcoin start to make you think more about just like the greater picture of our economics in this country and what money actually means? Um, to be honest, no. Um, you know, I, I always, you know, was, was interested in like acquiring money, but not necessarily ever interested in like, what is money and, and what's all about. But I will say like, once I started diving into Bitcoin, you know, there's the whole, at, at first you, you come to, you know, the, the conclusion that the number is going to go up, right. At least substantially higher than where it is now. Um, and so I think like, you know, 99% of people come into Bitcoin because it's a good investment. Um, and then, you know, that leads you to, you know, going down the rabbit hole of, of why Bitcoin is important and kind of like this ideological um, way. So to me, that that really stuck with me by by thinking about like kind of the underlying incentive structure that fiat um, gives to society versus Bitcoin. I think a lot of like materialism and just like short term thinking in general has kind of like derived from a fiat standard where you know, your, your money is, is depreciating over time. Your money is basically the, the value of, you know, your life's work and, and energy. So the, the value of your life's work and energy is going down. Um, and so, you know, you want to make the best use out of that as fast as you can. Uh, and so like, I think like almost subconsciously over, you know, 30, 40 years, that's really kind of like gotten deeply ingrained into society. Um, and then I think Bitcoin uh, is the complete opposite where people are thinking for the are, are thinking for the long term right you know you you know this this money is going to go up in spending power over the next you know at least 10 15 years i don't think anybody really debates that um so you know you want to take care of your body for example you want to take care of your mind you want to do other things to kind of like build a, a good uh foundation that that you can build off of you know your, your spending power and, and build a better life for yourself so to me, like when you apply that, not only to you, but like to the to broader society where everybody is thinking that way and everybody has that 
kind of subconscious like incentive structure. I think that just, you know, brings about a, a for lack of a better word, like flourish in, in society where, you know, people are, are building projects for the long term and, and planning out kind of like this um, infrastructure that's that's not just for here and now, but perhaps, you know, for something that, that you're going to see benefit of in like 50, 100 years. Like, I don't know, I think about like, like the Egyptians or whatever, like way back then, like when they were building stuff, they knew that it wasn't going to be done in their lifetime. But, you know, they wanted to build a project that was going to benefit their people like generations later on. So, I don't know. I, I think like Bitcoin and just like having a hard sound money, at, you know, at the underlying kind of foundation of, of the economy just changes the way society is in general. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I love that you said that because Bitcoin was the first time I really thought about or learned about time preference and really why we don't think about the future as much anymore. Um, so I want to talk to you about tell me about your evolution from sort of absorbing information and knowledge about Bitcoin to actually being able to start sharing your own and starting to analyze the, the ledger. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it starts off, you know, you're, you're just like looking at what everybody else is doing. And so, you know, you, you come to like these very surface level things and you're like, oh, this, this is cool. Right. And then um, after a while you become comfortable with that. And then, go step further and then you're like, okay, I, I understand, you know, all, all the metrics and stuff that are out there, right? Like, you know, for a while I would, I would go through Glassnode every morning and I would go through the whole website and just scroll through the whole website just to understand that I have like, uh, I think over a hundred, 150 metrics or something like that. And so just like getting an understanding of like how they kind of flow with each other. And then, um, you know, over time, like after a few months seeing, okay, you know, when these things happen, this tends to happen in the market, like just starting to see those correlations. And like, some of it is even, you just get a feel for it. Like, it's not always, um, you know, like, okay, this one metric is saying this, but it could be, you know, I'm looking at three or four things and starting to kind of like see the synergy between things. So that was kind of like, I, I went from understanding it probably the first month or so or month or two, and then to kind of like synergizing and, and really getting a good understanding of how the stuff works together. And then I would say now I'm kind of transitioning into this phase in it where I'm like making my own stuff. Um, and so now I'll, I'll, you know, I have a good understanding of all the metrics, right? And so I'll say, okay, it'd be interesting to compare this with this, right? And so I've created a couple different like ratios and stuff or different like indicators that, um, you know, measure things like momentum of different metrics and just different stuff and like mixing and matching and kind of like just tinkering away with the stuff. Um, that, that, that's kind of where I am now, I guess. Yeah, no, that's so cool. Well, so let's take it one step back for people who might be listening or watching this who are totally at that beginner level and trying to build a foundation of knowledge. So obviously the public ledger has so much financial data, this incorruptible financial data on it, and um, it captures pretty much every action on the chain, right? So can you kind of break down what are on-chain metrics and what is even the glass node for people that aren't familiar? Oh, yeah, sure. So, you know, in traditional finance, you have um, you know, just technical analysis, which is looking at just the price action. Um, and you you can look at things like the RSI, for example, is a very, very well-known thing. You're looking at the momentum of the price. You can draw lines on charts. Like I'm sure anybody on Twitter has seen a million people drawing lines on charts and stuff. And you're basically trying to look at, you know, markets are essentially behavior. And so you're trying to like analyze and look for patterns in the behavior in the market, right? Um, and, and what's unique to Bitcoin is like you said, we have this public ledger. And so you can see all the UTXO movements on the network. So you can see all the movements um, of, of coins on the network. Um, and you can see, you know, which participants are moving, you know, moving UTXOs to others and, you know, what is their, what is their behavior and all these kinds of things. And that's completely unique to Bitcoin in the sense that we basically have um, X-ray vision on the market. And not only can you see what's going on with price, but you can literally, you know, look on the look on the blockchain and say, okay, you know, the the big buyers are buying or the small buyers are buying, and you can look at the age and say, oh yeah, it's it's mostly it's mostly new market participants, and and I, like this is one thing over the past couple months, it's been mostly you know new market entrants. It hasn't been you know long term holders or or um, you know money that smart money that's been in the space for a long time. So you you can do all these different um, you know categories categorize, I can't say the word, categorize all the different uh, types of, um, 
you know, behaviors in the data and then come to conclusions based off of that. But that's completely unlike anything in the traditional finance world. And that's all because Bitcoin is decentralized. Bitcoin is the, the ledger is open for anybody to look at. And if you have, you know, super smart people like the folks that uh, work at Glassnode, which is a, a data provider for on-chain data, um, you know, they're able to do different heuristics and, and um, you know, they, they can get in there and, and do data science on the, on the, uh, on the, on God, I can't talk on the blockchain to, to derive these different metrics. So do you remember kind of like your first analysis and what you put out there? And did you immediately start to get a following? Cause I mean, to amass more than a hundred thousand followers when you only just started getting into Bitcoin in 2020 just seems incredible to me. Yeah, sure. Um, at, at first what I did was I would go steal charts from like, to be honest, I would still charge from other people on Twitter. And then I would go to um, Glassnode has something called Glassnode alerts. So it's basically like whenever, whenever something interesting, you know, happens and then they have like this bot that automatically sends out tweets. And so I would take those posts and I would I'll post up just because like I found it so interesting and I wanted to get my hands on whatever I could. Um, Cause like the data, the data set that I use now to be quite honest is, is really expensive. And so I didn't have access to that back then. So I was just, I was just kind of like, you know, just digging around through Twitter to see whatever I could find. And, and I would just, you know, post and make comments on it. And literally just because I found it interesting. And then it, it just kind of took a, a leg of its own. I mean, it, it was like, I went from a thousand to three or 4,000. And then from then I, I remember, I remember being like, if I could just get to 10,000, that'd be really cool. And, and that's, that's because like, when you get to 10,000, it goes from like, it, it just says like, whatever dot whatever the the hundred so like you get the decimal point in there and then it just says k so i just thought that looked like cleaner and look like more professional or whatever so i was like if i could just get to one if i if i could just get to 10k like that i would be so happy and then i remember getting to 10k and i was like this all right that that's all i'm gonna get like i'm never gonna get any any further than here and i just kept posting the stuff just because i found it interesting and it, it's just it's just been like i guess the community has found a really um strong interest in, in a lot of the on-chain stuff. And, you know, when, when you can just kind of, you know, put, put something in a, in a way for, for them to quickly just look at it and be like, Oh, okay. That's a cool data point. Like, and really break it down kind of into layman's terms. Um, I think that that's kind of the value there for a lot of people. I think it, it seems really confusing. And then having, having like the kind of translation from like the terminology that's used in kind of like the on-chain space versus, you know, how people, um, kind of need things broken down I, I try to be that bridge between the two you know because like there's a lot of people that aren't necessarily trading off the stuff um like i do some trading based off of this but most of the people that that are you know messaging me about it you know they're just they're just long-term holders and i think they, they just want to know what's going on right like they see the price dump and they're like okay what the hell is going on here and and you know they're not going to sell either way but they just like to kind of have that like um I don't know, like situational understanding of, of what, what's actually kind of fundamentally going on. So how has analyzing the chain um, strengthened your conviction in Bitcoin? Very much so. That's, that's a really good question. Um, this is something I've actually told a lot of people, like if I, if I didn't have the on-chain data, I don't know if I would have been as you know, confident that we were going to um, you know, bounce back up over the past three months that I had been with, with on-chain um, just because you know, for a while price had been diverging from on chain and, you know, but when you were looking at, at like price action or anything like that, um, you know, you, you just saw that Bitcoin was, was going to go sub 20 K and that kind of thing, just because like people were drawing all these patterns and, and stuff on the chart and, and um, looking at it in that sense, yeah, it looked like it was going lower, but when you saw fundamentally what was going on, it said a completely different story. So like in the short term, that's how it is, but in the broader sense, uh, I think like, in a huge way because you can see, for example, like the, the growth of, of users on the network, right? Like that's, that's hitting new all time highs while price has been like grinding downwards, right? Like you see unprecedented buying from small buyers. So like, like I said, you can break down the blockchain into different entities. So you can look at holders with like 0.1 to one BTC or like one to 10. And so I looked at all these cohorts under under 10 so i think like 10 is a decent kind of cutoff for retail investors um and so when you compare the amount of utxos held by um holders with with less than 10 btc 
and you compare that to the overall circulating supply, what you see is like over time, um, these, these small guys are, are buying up a larger and larger portion of supply, which of course is like really good in terms of like distribution of supply. You, you want to see the Gini coefficient go up, you know, you want to see um, the UTXOs be, be more widely distributed amongst all the, all the users on the network. So you can look at it that way, but then you can also look at what are the whales doing, right? Like over time, um, when you filter out ETFs, when you filter out Grayscale, when you filter out exchanges, um, what you see is that actually whale holdings go down over time. You know, they, they accumulated a lot of coins, whatever, in, in 2010, 2011. But over time since then, it's just slow distribution. And so, you know, that process, in my opinion, is just going to continue on until you have really healthy distribution because, of course, n number go up is going to incentivize more sellers, right? You know, there's people that got into Bitcoin 10 years ago and, you know, they can do whatever they want. And of course they'll have a little stack, but why wouldn't you sell off some of your, some of your holdings? And so that process will go on, you know, in the, over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And so over time, I suspect that the supply distribution is going to be much healthier than it is. Um, but also I think this is understated because, um, you know, when, when you look on chain, you're looking at these different entities, one large entity could be an exchange, right? And so like an exchange is holding coins for like hundreds of millions of people in terms of like Coinbase or, or Binance. So it's not necessarily like a perfect um, representation in my opinion. And like me and Willie have done some stuff where like we've taken like the portion of supply that um, the small guys hold um, on chain and then kind of like compared that to the number of, um, of coins that are held on, on exchanges and kind of tried to like interpolate it that way. But I think, I think, you know, you, you just really don't have an accurate picture of that because I suspect that the amount of coins that are held by these small guys on exchanges is way higher than, than we realize. So I think like not only is, is the distribution healthy and it's trending in a very healthy way and accelerating that way, but, um, also the fact that I think it's just very understated because of that, um, because of the fact that a lot of retail keeps their coins on exchanges. What were your thoughts on the correction when it happened? Did you feel like you were expecting it? Did you expect it to last as long as it did? And do you, um, obviously I feel like a lot of people are seeing sort of a little bit of that, the bull market return. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I, I didn't really see it coming. I, I was pretty bullish in between that 50, 60 K range. Um, but you know, once we started to see, um, certain things like um, coins that had previously registered as being held by long-term holders and, and those moving into what, what's considered liquid supply. So like supply that trades among speculative, uh, speculative traders. When you, see, when you saw that big uh, wave of coins becoming liquid um, from what had previously registered as illiquid, um, that, was a, that was a big red flag. And then also seeing just a huge amount of coins coming onto exchanges, which is presumed to be selling. Uh, so we had like 145,000 um, coins were moved onto exchanges in a matter of like a month or three, three, three weeks or something like that. Um, very short amount of time. So looking at those two things, like once, once you started to see that I, I became um, in short term, short term bearish, but you know, I, I do a newsletter and I put it out in the newsletter, it was just going to take time in my opinion for those coins to get reaccumulated. And since then we we've seen like, this kind of slow reaccumulation where like the, the strong hands, the, the uh, what, what shows up on chain as, as long-term investors, right? Um, they've been slowly buying since May 19th when we had that big drawdown. Um, and then over the past like two, three weeks, you've just seen like this big increase in, in their accumulation behavior. Um, so so that, that to me is showing that we're probably gonna go up further in the coming weeks, but looking at that back then to me, um, had shown that, you know, we were just kind of in this like prolonged sideways, like reaccumulation band until, um, you know, until that finally kind of got reflected in the price. And what you're talking about right now, that's sort of reflected in the stock RSI metric, right? Can I know it has a really long name, but can you talk about essentially what that is? And, and again, the information it, it offered? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's, there's two different metrics that I really used to look at this. So the first one is, um, this one's a little simpler and then I'll get to the RSI one just cause it's like a little more confusing. This is literally just, it's, it's called the illiquid supply shock ratio. People have called it different things, but it's just a ratio of um, the supply that's held by entities that are liquid. So like these are entities that take in a lot of coins, don't move a lot out. So these are what registers on chain as like these long-term investors, these diamond hands, right? People like to call them. 
Um, and so you compare that to the supply that's liquid. So this is supply that's trading in and out between speculative traders all day. And so you, you basically are kept through this ratio between the two, you're capturing the movement of coins from weak to strong hands, if you will. Um, and so that's one way to look at it. And then also um, this stock RSI, it's just an RSI that's run over the 30 day change of a liquid supply. So like looking at a liquid supply today, and then what was it last month, you know, uh, on, on uh, July 3rd, and then comparing the difference between the two, and then you're running a, um, a 365 day RSI, which is just an indicator that basically is tracking like the momentum of, of whatever you're looking at. So in this case, um, basically you're tracking the momentum of the supply shock in the market. Uh, and so like when you plot this out over a long, kind of like a, a longer time frame, um, what you see is like when you have a very strong down move that's considered a sell signal because you have a lot of coins becoming a liquid. But then when you have a move from that sell signal into a, a buy, which is if you're if anybody's familiar with an RSI, it's basically, it's basically like this range that the, the oscillator trades in. And when it goes below that range, it's considered a sell signal. Um, well, it's, it's considered oversold, I should say, um, in the sense of like traditional looking at it with price. And then above the, above the range, it's considered overbought. So, um, but you, what I'm looking at here is not price, I'm looking at um, the liquid supply. So it's, it's kind of counterintuitive where usually you would sell if the RSI went above the range because it's overbought and you would buy when it's oversold. But with this, when it goes above the range, it's actually a good sign. And then when it goes below, it's a bad one because you're saying, okay, there's a lot of supply becoming liquid right now, or you're seeing a lot become illiquid. So what's your outlook, I mean, moving forward? Because a lot of people are really excited and hopeful about Q4 with regards to Bitcoin. Um, where are you seeing things go? I mean, we none of us can predict the future, but in terms of on-chain analytics, what do you think? Yeah, sure. I, I think, first of all, like with on-chain, I can probably only give you a good, like a good guess for the next like month or so. Um, I think like when you get out into the next couple months, it's kind of like weather forecasting, I guess. Yeah. Like in the in the very short term, you can you can give a you know pretty accurate um, description of what what you think is going to happen. But then once you get out further, it gets you know hazier. So I would say I, with the most confident kind of time frame that I look at to be able to predict things is like several weeks to the next month or two. And so when I look at that time frame, I, I see price going up much higher than it is now. Um, just based off of several of things, you know, we talked about really strong accumulation. Um, it's the first time in Bitcoin's history where every single cohort by th their size is buying at the same time. Um, you know, we said uh, all time highs in, in net user growth, um, a lot of supply becoming a liquid. So you're seeing almost a, this underlying supply shock in the market. Um, and just the fact that Bitcoin is very oversold on, on a lot of um, different traditional um technical indicators also, but um, on-chain terms, I, I think over the next couple of weeks to month or two, you're going to see a, a further price rise. Um, in the short term, we could just kind of go sideways a little bit. It's, it's kind of hard to say. We just had like 10 straight up days. So just having like some kind of short-term mean reversion after going up so aggressively, I don't think it's, it's crazy to say that maybe we'll consolidate between like 35 and 40 for a week or two. Uh, but when I get out into like the next couple of weeks to month or two, I, I, I you know, I, I stand kind of strongly bullish, but to the end of the year, I, I think it kind of depends on the institutions, right? Like if we start to see a lot of people, you know, stick their neck out and say, oh yeah, we bought Bitcoin at, you know, what, cause the thing is a lot of these institutions, in my opinion, aren't going to come out until we get towards all time highs. Cause they want to look smart, right? They, they don't want to, they don't want to come out and say, we bought this thing. And then while it's going sideways for three months. So, you know, they'll, they'll come out maybe when we get up into like the 50, 60 range and they'll say, oh yeah, we bought that thing in the low thirties. Of course we did. Cause you know, they want to seem like they're geniuses. So I think like as price goes higher, um, you'll, you'll see more announcements just because like accumulation, like I said, is, is very strong on chain. Um, you know, exchanges are getting depleted and, and coins are moving to every single cohort, like every single cohort is accumulating. So uh, especially like you've seen this big uptick in whales over the last couple of weeks. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see some kind of like institutional announcement over the next couple of months or something like that. 
Oh, that would be so exciting. So do you dollar cost, I mean, do you dollar cost average or, and back in August when you first were really digging into this, it was, it was expensive, right? I mean, it's not easy for a college student to afford a Bitcoin. Like, did you start to put a lot of your money in there? Did your parents think like, whoa, you're crazy? Yeah. Parents weren't too happy. Um, parents still weren't too happy uh, until like the last couple months. And then they still don't know what I do, but they just know it's like, somewhat like people think it's cool now because of the following and stuff but they still have no idea really what I even do uh but anyway like yeah I just started kind of DCAing in at the beginning and and I would just put most of my paycheck in um I was working at Target at the time um so yeah I was just like taking like 80 90 percent of my paycheck and I was looking at you know like stock to flow and saying this thing is going to go to like 250,000 in the next couple months and I was like oh, the, the red dot's starting to go up. Like I got to get as much money into this thing as I can because the next couple dots are going to be way higher than they were now. Like that was literally my thought process looking back. Yeah. But yeah, it's just DCAing really heavily. But then over the last couple of months, I've started trading like a small portion of my stack, which I know like a lot of the hardcore Bitcoin people are going to be upset about. And like, I don't tell other people to do that, but I, I just like playing the market and I kind of think of it as like a game in a way. And so- I think like the best way to learn the game is through experience. And so, you know, I, I don't mind trading like a small portion of my holdings. What's the reaction been at your university? Like are other students really interested in what you're doing and want to learn about Bitcoin from you? Are there opportunities to even talk about Bitcoin in any of your finance classes? Yeah. So I've only had one finance class and that's, that was personal finance. And so like it, it wasn't, it was online. So like, I didn't even get to talk to the teacher or anything, but I sure will give them a hard time this year when I go back in person. Um, but, but yeah, I haven't really had much of a reaction just because of that. Cause I haven't really been around, you know, my teachers or, or students, mm -hmm. but I have gotten reached out by my school. So they're doing like some kind of article or something on like the, the, the school webpage or something like that. So that was pretty cool. But yeah, I, I haven't, I haven't really gotten any reaction from them just because like I haven't interacted with any of them, but I absolutely will give uh, all my econ and, and finance teachers a hard time next year. <laughs> Got it. So like you weren't even on zoom classes. This was like all no. online courses where you're not interacting with anyone. Yeah, exactly. I didn't even have any of the like, I've seen people who are have to like actually oh. sit in for like hour long zoom calls. I didn't have to do any of that. That's so fascinating. Yeah, I teach at USC. And so that's what I like for the last um, for the last year, two, two and a half semesters or something, I've been teaching via Zoom. So I assume that you were like interacting with your students or other cl you know classmates online and your professors, but I guess not. Yeah, no, I, I it's weird, too, because like some of the other people I know in the business school at ECU, they had like all Zoom classes. And maybe I just lucked out, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, all my stuff was it was just like, yeah, it's due on this day and just get it done whenever you want to. So, Well, so now that you've built this following and you've built sort of an expertise in this area and it's a growing industry and we're sort of at its infancy, if you believe in it, um, what's your goal? Like, what's your career goal and what do you want to do with this? Yeah, um, part of me, part of me just really loves like tinkering with the data and just like trying to find new stuff. So I, I would like to do some kind of like data research, um, some kind of job in that. Like I, I would really like to have some kind of firm theoretically, like, you know, analyzing full time and having like a, you know, some kind of like a team of on-chain analysts, just because I think a lot of us work on our own. And, you know, it's almost like the, uh, I always mess this quote off. It's like, the total is the better than the sum of the parts. Basically saying like when everybody works together, it's better than the, total yeah. of each person working in themselves um but yeah I, I think that would really apply to on-chain just because like there's never really been a team of of on-chain analysts from my understanding that have like come together and have actively you know just like work day in and day out to research this thing other than um i know like willie Wu and that guy david Pua i mentioned earlier they worked briefly at a fund but other than that like just i don't think there's any pure like um research firms in that sense and so it would be sick to have like five or ten of these guys together and just like yeah bouncing ideas off each other yeah no well in terms of the false narratives that are out there saying that like bitcoin could easily be hacked or it's just for nefarious activities when you actually look at the the ledger and all of it is just right there for someone to forensically analyze what do you uh, like can you kind of share for people that don't understand how much information is actually in there like can you 
potentially even figure out whose wallet a transaction is coming from based on maybe its history? Or is that still a little bit too difficult? Yeah, there, there are some companies that do that, like uh, Chainalysis, I think is, is the most popular one. And they know like 90% of transactions who's on one side of them, some crazy statistic like that. And, um, you know, if, you, if you're like buying Bitcoins on some kind of KYC exchange, um, you know, they're able to attach those UTXOs to, you know, your KYC account and then whatever, wherever those UTXOs move, they can track that and they know that they're your coins. Um, so you, like, you can do that, but the stuff I look at is just, for like market intelligence purposes. So like Glassnode and there's also other data providers like Nick Carter's uh, CoinMetrics and um, CryptoQuant is one of the big ones based out of uh, South Korea. So th they're all just looking at kind of like market analysis and like what's going on in the broader sense rather than like individual wallet movements. Like I know, I know some people do like to say, oh, this old whale sold or whatever and like looking at individual wallets and stuff, but I find that like very noisy. So I, I just like to look at what's going on in aggregate, right? So like, instead of looking at like the behavior of one specific whale, like what's the point of that when the whole behavior in the broader sense of all the whales is completely different. So I think you can like kind of drive yourself crazy looking at, at that. So I I, I think it, the only the only place where I would find that really interesting to have this like next level of, of um, intelligence that I think kind of crosses into the privacy aspect of it, which like these data providers are careful not to cross, mm -hmm. but would, would be to, to know the location of, of some of these new users that are coming on the network. Yeah. Cause like I mentioned, um, you know, there's new all time highs in net user growth. And I suspect a lot of that is probably from um, La Latin, Latin America. America. Yeah. yeah. Well, so when it, the correction actually happened, were you sort of thinking about just the sentiment that was out there, whether it was Elon Musk's tweets, the China mining, um, even just the grayscale developments, were you kind of taking all of those headlines and sort of analyzing that with the chain? Yeah, sometimes what, what happens is like on-chain analysis isn't necessarily like saying, uh, you know, looking bearish, right? But then some external factor happens and then that changes on chain. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like, you know, when, when you had Elon come in and start tweeting, you did see like a bunch of whales sell off, right? Or um, when we had the China FUD, you obviously saw a drop off in hash rate. And then you also saw uh, miners were selling. They, I think they sold about 5,000 uh, BTC in the data that I'm looking at over like a two or three week period. Um, which is, by the way, like not as severe as I think a lot of people were were saying. Like, and based just based solely looking at the data I look at, like the the whole narrative that miners were causing the price drawdown is was kind of like overstated. Um, but you know, there there could be stuff that I just can't see. Like, you know, maybe um, holdings of of like executives from minor companies are like kind of like these inadvertent things that were caused by the movement in in mining. You know, in, in hash moving, but you know, it wasn't like the minor wallets that Glassnode recognizes um, that were actually selling. So maybe there was some of that, but yeah, like you do see this, this, um, uh, you know, reflection of some of these like fundamental things that you hear about in, in the data. And it, it is really interesting to see that somehow, sometimes like the dog, uh, the, oh God, I'm going to mess this up. Like the dog wags the tail or the, the, the tail wags the dog. Like sometimes, um, what you usually, usually on-chain um, is king, right? Like price follows what the on-chain investor activity is doing. But there are these occasions where, you know, you have these like outside events that you couldn't perhaps foresee, but you do have to, um, you know, compare the, the on-chain activity to like what's going on fundamentally because then you, you realize why there's a shift, right? Like we're seeing, um, you know, a bunch of coins up in 50, 60 K that were um, becoming uh, liquid and then, you started to see a shift in that. And so like when you understood, oh yeah, like the grayscale premium was going away or, you know, you started to hear about a lot of FUD, you started to hear Elon talking about like that, that kind of draws a reasoning behind why you're seeing what you're seeing in the data. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So as I start to wrap up, what do you wish everyone would know about Bitcoin? Whether they're holders or people who are a little bit more skeptical about it, what do you want everyone to know? Uh, just, just keep DCAing and just like stay confident. Um, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the stuff that, you know, we look at is, is noise and, um, over time, all the trends that you see in on-chain are, are positive. And, um, I, I don't see anything that that's concerning in, in a broader sense. And so like, 
yeah, maybe I'm wrong and we don't go up in the next month or whatever. But, you know, for these for these long term investors, the 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 data looking in a broader sense is like undeniably bullish for Bitcoin's adoption in the long term. So just keep holding it on. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. And where can people find you? I know that you contribute to several newsletters. Um, so where can people find you? Sure. Thanks. Um, I'm on Twitter at W Clementi III. Um, and then I have a newsletter that I do with Pomp. So if you can either subscribe to his or um, if you want to do me a solid, subscribe to mine. And uh, mine is uh, BTC by WC3.substack.com. And so I send out the weekly letter that also goes out on pumps. But then if you sign up for mine, you'll get like these, I'll send sometimes like intro week updates. So like if I see something, you know, that really sticks out in the data, like sometime in the middle of the week, I'll send out like a quick update, which Pomp doesn't do. So that gives people an incentive to come to mind. <laughs>